could turn back time, mm. talk to your 18 year old self, yeah. what are you telling her? Yeah, I would tell her to trust herself. Mm, I like that. And yeah. Why? Um, I, I dealt with some insecurity. I think I did project a lot of confidence, but I, I often would second guess myself and decisions. And I think what I learned over time was mm. I had a good gut. Yeah. Like I, I know how to be thoughtful about things mm. and I just wished I wouldn't have worried so much about making the wrong decision and just kind of trusted myself a little bit more. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming back to the podcast today. Today, I'm joined by my very good friend, Amy Fletcher Faircloth, and she is the founder of AFM Communications. Her roots are in journalism. She um, actually began her career at the Gazette in Colorado Springs and then became a healthcare reporter. Um, and I think you did. Uh, were you a healthcare reporter for a while? Yeah. And like, covered the state legislature, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then um, she's covered everything, healthcare, insurance, and all these different things for even the Denver Business Journal. Um, but she is an amazing communicator over 20 years of experience and I've just gotten to know you in the more volunteer setting of young life but like your career I'm so excited to talk to you about just kind of how you got into journalism how you became a reporter and now you run your own firm so that let's get into it let's get into it. how did you start out in journalism that's what I want to know actually well, I always loved to write, even as a little girl. Okay. And, um, <laughs> but when I was in high school, I started thinking about, I was very a type A, like methodical thinker. Really? I <laughs> have known that about you. I know, you. it's shocking to hear. <laughs> it's shocking to hear. It's okay. We're both type A, so we like bond over yes, our type A-ness. <laughs> exactly. Um, and I was trying to think about, like in high school, they want you to like plan out your classes for yeah. like all four years kind of have an idea and I'm like well if I'm going to plan out my classes I need to know what I'm like gonna a s- high schooler wants you to do this mm-hmm. oh, like in high school okay. they want us to do this okay and I'm like oh I kind of need to think about like well maybe what do I want to study in college because that kind of mm-hmm. impacts things and I'm like well what I want to study in college yeah is really impacted by what I want to do right yeah and so yeah. I literally got a book from the library. Okay. And like just started reading these um, job descriptions. Oh my gosh, I love that. Mm-hmm. The library, guys, before Google, <laughs> yes. there was a library. You could check out a book <laughs> and read it. Yeah. 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 And actually, PR was something I was interested in. But okay. I, I, I did some research and found a lot of good PR people started out as journalists. Okay. See, I think I knew that just from being in the marketing industry, but I wouldn't have put that together. Like, you're like, okay, if I want to do PR, why don't I be a journalist first? Yeah. And that's cool. But it turns out I love journalism in a so, way that I couldn't have anticipated. Really? Yep. I loved it. So did you take journalism class in high school? Did you guys no. have that? No, I don't think we had journalism classes in high school. I went to a math and science academy. I know this sounds a little really? counterintuitive. Yeah. Yes, but I did work on the newspaper. Oh, mm-hmm. okay. So like at my school, we had journalism one and two. Mm-hmm. And I took it and I remember, I'll never forget my journalism class because I was sitting in journalism class when 9-11 happened. And like literally were watching mm. on screen. I watched the second plane and it was just like, like our, our teacher was like, I almost said professor, but our teacher was like, yeah guys this is news like this is this is in real time like this is worldwide news like and so we were like oh my gosh like and I sort of got bit by the bug a little bit there of like ooh, this is like amazing like I want to be this person who shares you know the information with everyone but it was interesting because I was like after that journalism class I was like I know I want to do communications to some degree Mm -hmm. but I don't know like I didn't want to feel like an ambulance chaser right like (laughs) who's gonna and I know there are different types of journalism there are I was a business reporter so you didn't have to chase any ambulances no ambulance chasing (laughs) (laughs) no yes no but I was working that day were you um, yeah really? at the Denver Business Journal? Oh my gosh! So yeah, so we had to go out and work that day. Oh, that's awful. Um, that must have must have been a hard day. It was a lot to process. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what were you guys? Were you just going out and talking to people? Or? Yeah, we were just kind of seeing you know what was happening downtown. Yeah. And you know a lot of people ended up leaving that day. Yeah. Um, just going home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And going home. But we were, you know, journalists work in those situations. I know. It, that's something I always thought about after my journalism class and after that moment was like you have to work mm-hmm. like you this is now like you're on your this is your zone you can't just be like oh I want to go and process this it's no. like you got to yeah. go that's yeah. tough it's a tough job sometimes yeah mm-hmm. so what did you like about your journalism career like I mean I know oh. you still write today but yeah. what did you like about being I love, on the ground yeah I love writing I love meeting people and learning new things mm-hmm. and 
being able to provide information to really important discussions that are happening. Mm. And, you know, for me, that was health care yeah. and things going on in the legislature. And that combination for me was just a great one. Yeah. And it is a great one. What piqued your interest in health care? Um, well, I mentioned that I went to this math and science academy yeah. and I was really interested in kind of medical things. Okay. Yeah. And so I really thought I was going to be like a healthcare science writer type of person. Okay. But when I was in graduate school, I was in DC and okay. I was covering, um, I was the DC correspondent for a paper in a little small town in Iowa and I was covering, um, Senator Grassley, Charles Grassley. Yeah. He does a lot of Medicare and okay. in that process I learned how. How, you know how we fund healthcare is mm. almost as important as the actual healthcare that we provide because if you can't pay for it and provide access to it and finance it, yeah, that creates big problems. And so that's kind of where <laughs> I went, like in this business healthcare trajectory. Yeah, that's so cool. Now, did you? How did you start working at the Capitol? Because I know then you went on to work at the. I mean, we weren't. I don't know if we were at the Capitol at the same time. I was there 2011. So yeah, I was there before you. Okay, but yeah, I how am, did you I end am up much there? Much older than you. <laughs> she doesn't look it I mean we could be sisters but um yes you're sneaky that way <laughs> yeah um no I was there uh, starting in 2000 okay yeah and then like how did you what took you to the capital yeah well they wanted someone there my editor actually had um, been a bureau chief at the legislature and okay. we knew that something there's a lot of important business that happens at the capital and we knew yeah. that business readers needed to know about it and yeah. there's a lot of health care that happens at the capital as well and so yeah. it was a natural intersection there yeah I think um the capital is such a unique environment mm. as we know it is. and I think every state capital has its own kind of sure. vibe mm -hmm. but what was it like for you to be a woman a, and you're pretty young at this point right yeah a young woman mm -hmm. working at the capital because we don't think we've ever talked about this right but I'm curious if you had a similar dynamic to me or if it was different being like on the press side versus me being a legislative aide. Yeah, I bet it was a little different in that when you're a journalist, you kind of are viewed as having the power a little bit because yeah. you're the person telling the story. And yeah. so I think you're more of a threat. <laughs> <laughs> You're more of a threat, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. My bosses were always like hiding, like, there's a journalist. <laughs> like, I'm crouching in my chair, but they're always like, you know, hiding yeah. like in their cubes. Yeah. Like, oh no, a journalist right. is in here looking for me. Right. And what do they want? What yeah. are they going to say? Yeah. Totally get that. So I think that was a little yeah. different. But, and, and at that time, though, you know, now there's a lot of young people in journalism. But back when I was a reporter, mm -hmm. the real senior people were, you know, in their 50s. <laughs> So you're like this young woman yeah. running around interviewing people. and <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. But um, I think, you know, I found that once you kind of demonstrate that you know how to do your job mm -hmm. and you do it well, then you that's really what people care about. Yeah. So you didn't feel like uh, you were an underdog as much. I mean, a little bit. Okay. A little bit. I mean, it's kind of an, an intimidating um, atmosphere. I mean, working yeah. at the, you know, working in D.C. Yeah. as a 23-year-old, that was very intimidating to me. Oh, I, I mean, imagine. I literally interviewed U.S. senators when I was 23 years old. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So what was that like? Yeah, talk about what that experience, because, I mean, we might have people who are listening who are like, that's me. I'm that girl who's right. 23. Like, what's it feel like, and what did you learn? Yeah, well, I was really intimidated, and... Yeah. And I was afraid of making a mistake, um, partly just because that's my personality. That's a whole other <laughs> issue. But I mean, I think what I learned is that, you know, they're they're just people. Yeah. You know, they put their pants on one yeah, leg after the other. Yeah. They're just yeah. Um, people. And I think just like going into things prepared, but yet confident is mm -hmm. is important. Did you ever feel like you dealt with like sexism or just even, I don't know, like just age like, just because of your age and your gender? Because mm -hmm. I definitely felt like I dealt with that in my work in politics. Yeah. I feel like, for me, journalism has a lot of women in it. Yeah. Um, it really does. You know, journalism schools are graduating more women than than men. I would say, for me, it was probably more ageism. Not within my workplace. Yeah. But within the people I interviewed. Like I yeah. said, you know, I think they probably looked at me. Like you're you know, a baby. <laughs> I, ha I mean, I looked younger than I was. And I was young. Like, yeah. it was, you know, they, they probably were like, is she even graduated school yeah. yet? <laughs> um, but again, I think, you know, just sticking with your job, doing the best that you can, mm -hmm. you know, that that kind of helped you through it. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. I think that uh, one of the things I had to navigate as like a, I guess I was 24 when I was at the Capitol, but it was just, 
I felt a lot of intimidation. Mm -hmm. Like I felt a lot of like there is a power structure here and I have to figure out how to navigate it. And maybe you were a little outside of that as a being pressed because press sort of necessarily is outside of that. Right. But like I definitely hopefully it should be. Yeah, right. it should be. <laughs> we That's want the goal. Be, yeah. We don't want it to be too incestuous. <laughs> no. But yeah, I just I think that was something that in reflecting now a decade later or more, I'm like, I, I just I know that that's challenging when you feel that and I'm curious like have there been any like obstacles or challenges you've had to overcome in your career where you either felt misunderstood as a woman or um you know or maybe out of place even like mm-hmm. sure yeah <laughs> you're like where do I which one do you want me to tackle exactly um yeah no it's hard because I think that you know i I'm an outspoken person. Um, I think that even when I was young, I projected a confidence that I didn't necessarily always have. <laughs> um, and I think that sometimes can be misconstrued yeah. sometimes. And I, one thing that I did learn, especially even in my, you know, like nonprofit, like my volunteer work mm-hmm. that I did was, you know, learning to kind of lead from vulnerability a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Um, and I think it's important to to be straightforward in your communication. Um, but I think that it's, it's hard to always lead from your, um, you know, strength can be hard. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think one thing that like stands out to me about you is that you are very confident and you are very strong, but like you do care, you know? Mm. And I'm curious how you've been able to present yourself in a way that people can connect with and not feel intimidated maybe because you are so confident (laughs) (laughs) I mean I'm thank you for saying that because I do care I really do do. do. I really do care and I think you know part of it is is that in my work like the people come first like everything that we Mm -hmm. do you know even in my in my role as a communications professional now like we're trying to do things for people yeah (laughs) and so you can't lose the people like in your work and I think you know having that genuine interest in people whether it's your customer or an end mm-hmm. user or your employees um, yeah. you know it's it's important yeah would you do you consider yourself a leader when you like look at I mean maybe where you look at where you are now like do you consider yourself a leader and have you always considered yourself as a leader yeah I think I have I mean yeah. part of it's just my personality yeah um you know I was always the person you know, I ran for student council yeah, you know yeah. I've always kind of been in that role and of course you know with owning your own business you do manage people and you do mm-hmm. lead people and and again you know even in the in the volunteer capacity I've I've done yeah, that. that's how we met. That's how we met. You yeah. were on a board and I was yeah. on a board. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you think that is it possible, though, to like when you because I this is something I've struggled with because I'm like you, like I've always been kind of like I was the bossy kid. Right. You know, like I was always a leader kid in school. Mm-hmm. But I think sometimes I've had to learn the way that I approach people has had to change over time in order to get things done right mm. like because yeah. I can have a very I'm Italian I'm you know yeah. I can have a very direct approach with people and mm-hmm. in politics that works in journalism that works it's mm. like hey I need this by this time you know yeah but I find in other contexts I've had to like soften that or like adjust sure. and so like how have you navigated those waters coming from kind of the more dog eat dog world of like journalism to like maybe you're working with a ministry or you're working with you know, people that don't roll that way. Yeah. I think part of it is meeting people where they're at and then understanding where people are coming from. Mm. And I remember having a meeting with a colleague back when I was young. Yeah. I had left the the business journal, was working for a nonprofit, but a nonprofit that was living in a business organization. And I remember him sitting across from me saying, I feel like you're not listening to me. You're just thinking about what you're going to say next. Ooh. Oh, I know. So you know what? <laughs> Ooh, that's so awkward. What'd you do? Well, you know what? He was right. <laughs> You're, like, <laughs> You're right. I can't wait to get my next point in. <laughs> he was right. He was right. And it yeah. was a great wake up call for me, though. Like, yeah. that is so hard to hear. Yeah. But I think that, you know, and honestly, in that moment, I, I prayed. And he immediately could, like, see the difference, mm. even in, like, Your he, didn't, countenance shifted he didn't know what I was doing, yeah. you know? But, um, yeah. You just prayed, like, a silent prayer to yourself, like, Lord, help me help not me get listen. mad right now. <laughs> or help me listen, help you me know? Listen. Yeah. yeah. And and there was something about that. He's like, I can see that you're listening to me now. Like, he commented on it, you know, and he didn't even know I was doing that. So um, I think listening and I think trying to see things from other people's perspectives. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've also learned that I my mind moves very quickly. Yeah. You and I like to move forward very yeah. quickly. And people move at a different pace. And I, sometimes it's just 
slowing down yeah. and, and taking people along with, you know, where you're going. Yeah. Sometimes it's annoying and you're like, <laughs> why can't you just get it? Like, you but, know, but, but you're right. But I also sometimes will start talking about <sighs> things. I do this at home and my husband's like, um, what are you talking about? Like, I'll start my <laughs> conversation. Like, I've already thought about like this for 15, <laughs> your 15 steps down the road. And yeah. he's like, can you go back to step one? Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's start there. Yeah, that's such a good point. And I think this is an interesting thing. I mean, you mentioned it, but I want to go back to it of like when you're in a moment like that, like just even – like that's a way you can bring your faith into something where you're in a moment where someone's calling you out and you can just say a quick prayer because I think we don't think in the work context mm. all the time like how do you bring your faith in so I'm yeah. curious because you have been in these you know important roles or um yeah like powerful positions of influence in your work but like how do you integrate your faith with your work mm-hmm. I think some of it is just kind of staying true to some of your core values I mean for you know the work that I do today and the work that I did as a journalist like you know truth is totally like a guiding principle yeah. through all of that yeah um and then just you know I think part of it's just kind of staying true to your values yeah like we don't we don't work with people working on things that we don't think are a good idea yeah <laughs> yeah if it's uh, something that is maybe yeah it goes against your values you don't yeah you're not going to be because you really are a spokesperson in a lot of these ways like as a communicator like you're yeah. writing the press releases you're yeah you're communicating on behalf of someone else right. so if you don't align with what they're doing yeah and that makes sense to me I think that's something that people sometimes want to separate their work mm. from their spiritual life so they're like I can be this person on Sunday, but then, like, I'm this person at work that's different. And it sounds like you've integrated those. Yeah, I'm really, like, huge on authenticity. Like, that's really important to me. Um, Part of it is because I need that in my life. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't want to have any regrets. I'm kind of an anxious person. I went through (laughs) about, like, when I had a hard time sleeping. And I'm like, I just want to know that, like, when I go to bed at night, like, everything that I'm doing is authentic to who Mm. I am and to what I've to what I value. Yeah, and what you've built too because yeah. you've built a good reputation now at this point in your career and you don't want to like unravel it with aligning yourself with something that you, it's that's not. not great for people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um well, I'm curious like, you know, politics, journalism, I mean, they're tough industries like how have you dealt with some of the pressures? I mean, cuz I do think there are pressures of I mean, even in our sphere of marketing, PR like there's pressures of timelines. There's pressures of clients aren't happy with something. You know, somebody yet calls and yells at you. Why did you report it this way? That's not true. Like, mm-hmm. how have you handled that? Yeah. I mean, I think it's important to kind of take a step back. I think also I struggled with, as a younger person, really, I mean, I think maybe I still struggle with this. I want people to like me. I yeah, want people to be happy. We all do. <laughs> yeah. But I also think it's a woman thing a little bit. Yeah. No, I think you're right. Yeah. I think you're right. I think men sometimes have an easier time just being like, eh. yeah, or, <laughs> Take a hike, you yeah, know? Yeah. I was going to say something else, yes. but this is, you know. <laughs> we'll keep it PG. Yeah, we're going to keep it PG. Um, and so I think that's part of it is, like, I think sometimes you need to let go of people. Yeah. Of caring so much about what other people think. And I also find that for me and my team, mm-hmm. sometimes we just need to take a step back. Yeah. You know, and sometimes, like... You just need to take a pause, and sometimes yeah. things aren't so bad. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, if you step away from the angry client email <laughs> for yeah. a minute, you yeah. might come up with a better response than yeah. what you initially were. Or right. when you read it a second time, you're like, "Well, maybe, maybe they're not that mad. Maybe they're not that mad." But yeah. you're, yeah, and and I have found that. And then I'm just gonna say this is maybe not quite related to what you're talking about. Yeah. Pick up the phone. Yes. Pick up the phone. I, that's actually great <laughs> advice. Yes. Tone is so hard to gauge. Yes. It's so, and I think especially the younger generation like they they want to do everything through text mm-hmm. and i sound like i'm archaic right reporters now reporters still do this now really oh yeah like they just text stuff or they pick up the phone no they text and they text they let me know that they need whatever yeah and sometimes they quote what i say in the text and you're like okay <laughs> nah. not everyone yeah not everyone but yeah but, so reporter. does it work better if they pick up the phone I prefer that, but yeah. I don't know if that's just because I'm old, you know. <laughs> but. I do think there is something about getting things done, though, with people. And, like, I do think the reporter-PR relationship is an interesting one because it's, like, PR company needs – like, the reporter needs a PR company to do something, like, or to, like – Or not. Or not. Or they want to try to influence, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. 
But it's like, it's about relationships. It's about who you know. And it's kind of like, how do you keep those relationships when everything is so like robotic and email and like there is something I think being lost in the art of like personal relationships. Yeah. And I try like when we're doing work at the Capitol, like I try to. I mean, I, the, a lot of these people I've known for a long time. Right. Like, some people were working when, you know, believe it or not, some people were working when I was working there. Um, yeah. But I think it's important to maintain that relationship. I go down yeah. there and I see these people in person just yeah. to be like, hi, yeah. I'm Amy. Yeah. Well, and I don't know if you still have your office right across the street from I the Capitol. But yeah. Like, I haven't used it. Yeah. <laughs> but you have that proximity of, like, you yeah. can just run it's across there. the street mm-hmm. and be like, hey, yeah. okay, yeah. I'm here. Exactly. I love that. Yeah. So what's, like... um you know, a leadership challenge or something you've had to overcome, like a mindset or a difficult Mm -hmm. boss or just, you know, an environment that you've been in? Yeah. So, (laughs) so after I left journalism, um, I went to work for a nonprofit and it was my first, like being a journalist is unique. Yeah. You have a ton of autonomy and a lot of like the corporate norms, are just not things that you deal with. It's probably like being a realtor. Like, you don't... Yeah, yeah. I mean, we were in the office. I had editors and whatever, but it's just different. You're not at your desk nine to five. No, and when I was at the Capitol, they're like, where is they... Like, they didn't even see me, right? Like, you know, when I was at the Capitol. Um, But I had a boss who really loved to help people out and wanted to say yes, but he ended up um, sometimes over committing I was an associate director so you know he was like sure we can do that and then you know I felt like I was the one that had to actually do all the things right yeah and it was tough and I felt very responsible for everything that we did in that organization and I think that learning how to really identify which balls are my balls to keep in the air and which are other people's was critical that's a good way of saying it. It's yeah. like boundaries because especially exactly. when you have a boundaryless boss who's like, yeah, yeah we could do it. We can yeah. do it. And you're the team like catching everything. <laughs> like, I don't know how we're going to do this, yeah. but I'll just work harder and work harder. And, and then you get burnt out or you get resentful. Exactly. And what I've also found is, you know, even outside of that job, like in the volunteer world, sometimes I was leading like younger volunteers. Yeah. When you are carrying everyone else's you know, balls trying to keep them in the air, you are preventing other people from stepping into the leader that they, that's such a great that they point. should be. I definitely, I want you to say that again. <laughs> so people, so, just say that again. <laughs> so when it can be tempting to keep everyone's balls in the air, sometimes yeah. you're taking things from other people and you're yeah. preventing them from growing in their leadership. This is such an important point for anyone who's type A. Yes. And anyone who's a perfectionist or yeah. like wants to micromanage because I, think naturally like I was the person in college where if you put me on a group paper I was like this is my hell like I, this is my actual hell like mm. I have to work with these people and they're part of my grade <laughs> and sometimes you, you don't get to say who's on the group paper with you you know right. and it was like I remember this one paper I was on uh I will not mention who it was with but it was with someone in cl- my classes and it was just like she just did not approach the paper the same way like it yeah. was like she was one of those who would like pull an all-nighter to like get her papers done and I'm like I like my sleep like I do not want to pull I hate all-nighters like I was a college kid who did like one all-nighter and was like I'm never doing this again like I hate this wow I hated it so I was like (laughs) I like sleeping so I would like kind of map out okay you know I got to get this done you know I'll maybe I'll work on it you know a little bit here a little bit here and then I'll crank it out and I'll be in bed by 10 you know um but she was like her approach was so different and it was like I'm like are going to be up all night, you know, and I'm panicking because I'm like, she's just taking so long to like work on this together. And I realized though, in that time, like what had happened was I couldn't like, couldn't go control mm-hmm. of the paper. So I was like, cause I was like, I need to make sure we get an A and I right. don't trust your work. Right. So like, I now have to like go in your process and then fix your work so that I can make sure I get my A. And in hindsight, that could have worked for a paper, but like when you're collaborating with teams, oh. Yeah. It doesn't work because no. over time you're burning yourself out. Right. Like you're trying to control so that nobody makes a mistake. Right. And, and then no just, one likes that either. And nobody likes that. Yeah, no, no one, one likes, likes to be that. micromanaged. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so um, I'm curious, like, you know, you lead a team now. Like yeah. what have you – what what growth points have you hit to try to learn how to, like, manage people, lead people in teams? Yeah. Um. So – as we discussed, I was a journalism major. Right. Like, I did not go to business school. I did not come up through the corporate world. Like, yeah. really running my business is my first, like, you yeah. know, 
mm-hmm. being in the business world. And so it's been something that I've had to learn. And um, I think that... Do you mean it, just like the the LLC, like admin side of well, it? or leading, I mean, as a journalist, yeah. as a reporter, you don't manage anyone. You you're manage yourself. You're a lone yourself. wolf. Yeah. <laughs> you're a lone wolf. Yeah. Yeah. And so like managing teams and making sure, you know, the right people are doing the right jobs and then understanding what people need to do to do their job well. I have yeah. a colleague who works very differently than I do. Yeah. Um, but I have to present things in a way that reflects the way that she works and yeah. we have to communicate in a way that reflects the way that she works and as long as she's getting her stuff done then it's like you don't need to speak to how she approaches it no yeah yeah not at all she's wonderful she just does things differently than I do I think this is good in marriage as well (laughs) it's good in so many ways (laughs) I feel like in marriage like and uh Stefan's in the room but I feel like we're so often like I'm like why why would you do it that way like that doesn't make sense yeah. to me but I find that he gets to the same end results sure. it's just a the different process is different yeah and you need to respect those differences they're beautiful yeah they're beautiful this colleague I'm telling you about she saved us today she's very detail oriented mm-hmm. like we'll read every word of everything mm-hmm. we're about to push send on this literally happened today <laughs> like we're about to push pre- send on a press release she's like oh my gosh this paragraph has like three things that are wrong in it and I was oh. like Thank you. Thank God for her work style yes, and her gifts. Exactly. Because otherwise that'd be out in the universe and <laughs> be wrong. Yes. Well, and I think that's the thing too is like when you're building a team, it's really trying to identify like what is someone's, what's the gold in someone? Like I remember yeah. when I was like at, you know, working for the Republican Party, I had like a batch of interns they were always like giving me interns Mm -hmm. because no one wanted to deal with the interns Mm -hmm. so it was like I I was yeah I was the receptor (laughs) of the intern yeah but I was like it was hard for me because I'm like I was already drowning in my job I was working like 60 hours a week I I was like a one-woman operation running all this fundraising stuff and then I'm getting these interns that now I got to train them I got to make sure they're doing something in their day sure so I got really good at quickly spotting yeah what the gold in that person was like I had one intern who was so administrative. She was amazing. She yeah. was my she was my yin to my yang. You know yeah. what I mean? Like I am not administrative. Like I'm kind of like scattered and like she was so organized as like I would give her something and she'd have to add up all of the, the receipts and they'd always add, calculate out. I would do it. They would not calculate out. <laughs> and so it was like, oh, yes, you're yeah. the best. But then I got my next intern and she was like horrible like mm-hmm. she would like do the admin stuff and do it worse than I would and so then I'd have to redo it all right and I was like okay well I can be frustrated that I don't have my perfect admin intern or I can figure out what this person is really good right. at and use them for that exactly and she was so good on the phone so mm-hmm. good with people so you know what I had her doing I had her calling venues and uh, restaurants and like you're in charge of planning these events like I want you to network with the vendors figure out where we're doing these events like I don't have time to be on the phone all day like and you do and, mm-hmm. and it was great and so it was just like I think like you said like it's finding the right seat on the bus yeah it's so important and it really serves other people yeah people want to work in their gifts they right? do and yeah. they don't want to work uh, like in something where it's like they're forced to fit a mold that they don't naturally fit. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something I found about myself in my own career. Like I feel like it's just been trying things and being like, nope, that doesn't fit. That doesn't fit. That doesn't fit. That doesn't fit. <laughs> um, so just transitioning a little bit though, like one of the things like I'm wanting to talk to you about is just the whole dynamic of being a working mom. Yeah. I think this is a topic that isn't talked about enough. Mm. I think it really – I, the working mom friends I talk to it's kind of go from saying like either I feel isolated because I don't have a ton of friends that work or mm. I feel like I'm left out of like mom world a little mm. bit. And so I'm curious what your experience has been being a working mom. Yeah. I mean, I think I've felt both of that, um, those things. Um, I am kind of in between those worlds, I feel yeah. like a little bit because I do have the flexibility mm-hmm. like today. Mm-hmm. You know, we're we're talking right now, and it's um, the week before Thanksgiving, and so yeah. they had like like Thanksgiving lunch at, at school, and so oh, I was able cute. to pop out for that, and then come back and find the press release that was broken. <laughs> so you know, so but it is a juggling, you know, it is a juggling thing that you're doing. I I will say that my husband helps make this possible in yeah. a way that other husbands need to help make this possible for women because he is so involved. Mm. Um, He's really hands-on with our children, and he's also very supportive of my work and my passions. He knows I love it. He knows I'm passionate about it, and he's all about that. And so... What's that look like practically for you guys? Like, what do you mean by that? We have discussions 
we have a lot of communication and yeah. he literally said to me, can I do a meeting at 4.30 on November 30th or whatever yeah. it was? Um, because he wanted to make sure, because our kids are home then. Oh, okay. And he wanted to make sure that I didn't have something going on yeah and so I think you know in some households that'd be a different conversation yeah that meeting would have been scheduled yeah you know and then it would have just fallen for the the wife to figure it out out. Mm -hmm. and that doesn't happen in our family I love that I think it's an interesting dynamic and I mean I'm getting in a little bit of like controversial waters here though but I think Christian women specifically that work Mm-hmm. Now we get into a layer deeper of mm. the whole, should you be working? Mm. Should you be home with the kids? And all the like subliminal messaging oh, of mm-hmm. like, you know, I know for me, I I only recently woke up to this realization of like, I think part of the reason I stepped out of a lot of work after getting married is I felt like I needed to make space to like have kids and like do the mom thing. Mm-hmm. And that, that meant I needed to shut down mm. all my work. And that wasn't coming from my husband. So I'm like, where was that coming mm. from? And as I've reflected, I'm like, I think it's come from kind of just the church is like sort of as a single woman, you know, mm. I felt like, you know, and we've talked about being single ladies well into our 30s, like, yes. you know, like uh, late 30s for some of us. <laughs> late 30s, yeah. <laughs> but like, as a, and I want to get to that, too. But like as a single woman, I think you sort of feel like it's message to you like your your role mm. is to get married and then have the family and like that's a good thing that's a god thing totally but then like what do you do when you've had this career yeah for a decade and you're like reconciling these two identities yeah you know that just wasn't something that I had to struggle with it's not how I grew up my mom okay. was both home and worked at okay. different points in our childhood um I haven't grown up in churches where I've received that um so I think that's just a really personal yeah thing that and I just think there are people that do struggle either they don't struggle with like because they had a great exposure of like hey because my mom was working too so yeah. it just more I think I had this sense of like you know uh, that women, like I was talking with some friends, I'm like, how did you decide to become a stay at home mom versus stay working? Mm-hmm. And it does seems like it is very individual for each family. Yeah. What resources do they have? Yeah. What's the husband's opinion? Sure. What do the kids need? Like, yeah. And like, I don't know if you've, cause you roam in a lot of mom networks and working mom networks. I do. Like, what do you see kind of are the trends with that? I think it is very individual. And I think that a lot of people, you know, want want to be home. And let's yeah. be honest, childcare is so expensive. Yeah, it is. Our our kids are both in school now and we feel like we got to be raised cuz it's childcare yeah. is so expensive. And I think for a lot of families it just doesn't even make sense financially yeah. for for some, you know, for the wife to work necessarily. Um, but you know, for us, we just had to look at our situation. My husband's also flexible as well. So yeah. we can like, we can be present in a way, but we can also like work as well. Is that something you guys talked about, like wanting to have that dynamic or was that just kind of how it worked out? It just kind of worked out that way. Okay. Like I think we both, my husband loves being a dad. Okay. My husband loves being a dad so much that I think my, my kids see that. And like, if you ask my oldest son what <laughs> he wants to be when a girl, he grows up, he'll say a dad. A dad. Oh my mm-hmm. gosh. That's so cute. Yeah. So my husband loves. So he's like, it's a profession. Dad is. <laughs> a professional dad but that's how present my husband is I love right that. you know like I don't think he fully understands all that my husband yeah. does outside of being a dad because he's so but he's so present so it just it it worked out that way for us that's great and now okay we got to get into the, the single lady stuff because yeah hey is, single ladies yeah this is the juice people want to know because <laughs> it's like so when did you meet Jacob mm-hmm. and how long were you single and what was that experience like for you <laughs> That's a whole nother podcast. We like got I, time. We got time. I can totally. <laughs> got 30 minutes. <laughs> um, well, let me just start by saying that my parents got married when they were 23 years old. And oh so gosh. I kind of thought like. Well, and are they still married? Yes. Oh, that's so They're beautiful. They're still married. I love that. Yeah. And um, I thought that would be my story. Yeah. You know. A and, lot of us do. Yeah. And it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't. And okay. um, it was hard for me because it's something that I deeply long for. And I mean, yeah, not having that desire met is really difficult, no matter what the desire is. Um, yeah. And so it was it was hard. But I 
you know, didn't get married until I was 37. Is that right? Mm-hmm. I didn't know I was 37. Yeah, I got married when I was 37. Jacob and I have been married for 10 years, so y'all know how old I am now. She doesn't look it, though. <laughs> if, you're, if you're not watching, she does not look it. It's, it's kind of weird. Yeah. I'm Thanks. like, what do you do? What's, what is your skincare routine? <laughs> it's genetic. I'm, I'm, yeah. Get it from my mama. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, we met, we met at, we met at church. We met in a small group, and we you know from a first date to walking down the aisle was about a year. And that was us too. Yeah, it's been it's been great. And and I know you feel this way as well. Like also worth the wait. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. I honestly, in reflecting, I've had like a difficult past year. Um, and in reflecting, it's like you don't know where your bottom at is at necessarily until life throws you some mm. things. And when you hit your bottom and your partner, like, is who you think they are and they are more than you think they are, they're more supportive, they're more amazing, you're like, this was worth it. Like, I am so glad I did not get married to somebody just to tick a box or Mm -hmm. to make, like, my social circle feel better about my singleness or to make myself feel better. It's lonely. Oh, yeah. It's so lonely. I'm curious, like, did you ever feel being single in the church or being single as a working woman, did you ever feel like uh, any kind of way about that? Or was that just like, oh, I'm good. I'm just rocking you know, my, my career. No, I mean, I think that like when you, when you are involved in the church, there's a lot of people getting married around yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. You're a bridesmaid many times. <laughs> yeah. And I remember like one of my bosses being like, I was going to wedding. He's like, do you really want to go to another wedding, Amy? And I was just like, yes, I'm so, I, I was so yeah. thrilled for them, but it is yeah. hard and it does feel lonely. Yeah. And you know, for me, I took that um, in a negative direction, you know, mm-hmm. I was like, I took that as something that kind of fed an insecurity that I had. So it was something mm-hmm. that I really had to grow through. Yeah. Did mm-hmm. you, um, how did you know that you had made, met the right guy though, when you did meet him? How did I know? Yeah. You know, I, I think there was just a piece about it and mm-hmm. there was just this overwhelming sense of wanting to start life with this person. Yeah. And yeah. I, th- I think that that's how I describe it too. It's just like, I think that was something I was so stressed when I was dating. Like, how am I going to know? Like, what if I yeah. pick the wrong person? Yeah. And like, it's they turned out decision. to be like Mr. H- or was it Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde situation. <laughs> right. And like, and you that know, happens, right? and it does. I was like really worried about it. But yeah. I think that, um, I think it's just that peace that pervades this, especially if you believe in, in God and you're praying through it and mm-hmm. you're asking God for direction. I do think it's just a sense of peace. You know, mm-hmm. I'm curious, like, um, so the transition from like, you know, you're, you're working, you can get married, then you become a mom. How old are you when you become a mom? 39. Okay. So you have your first baby mm-hmm. and what's, what's the identity mm-hmm. dynamic, like shifting from, you know, working woman, wife, and now mom, like, did you ever go through any sort of like, who, like identity shifts? You know, I am one of those people who's always staring at my belly button, right? <laughs> like what's going on in here? Yeah. Like, how do I feel about this? Yeah. And it's something I was really thoughtful about, Yeah. you know? And I was like, I, I, I was open and held loosely to like, maybe I want to quit working for a while. Yeah. Maybe I want to close down my business and go work for, you know, someone else. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I started my business before I got married, Yeah. Uh, which is again, whole nother challenge, whole nother thing. Yeah. Um, but you know, kept it and have kept it in part because I do like that flexibility that it provides. Like I want to do, I want to do both. Yeah. Did you, did you struggle to at all with like, um, being like being known as like, you know, Amy journalist communicator to then like Amy mom, like in mom world, you know, like, (laughs) yeah, but I was so excited to, you know, I mean, when you have spent your life thinking that you're going to get married when you're 23 yeah. <laughs> and have children when you're 25. You know, I was just so excited. Yeah, I was, was so excited to have a baby. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, okay, so that this is an interesting because we don't have kids yet. We've been trying for two years. Mm-hmm. But when you're an older mom, yeah. that's like its own yeah. thing. And I feel like people sort of like 
there's all sorts of fear mongering around like, you mm. know, geriatric pregnancies and like yeah. high risk and <laughs> gets labeled on your paperwork at the top. Yeah. Geriatric pregnancy. So how did you handle that? I asked questions. Okay. I am a, you know, former reporter. Yes. And so I asked my doctor about yeah. this, you know, like I wanted to know, like, yeah. what does this mean? Yeah. And he just laid out the statistics for me. And, and, and honestly, did you cry after that? Cause I would have been terrified. No, because it, the, I mean, honestly at my age at, you know, 39, there's yeah just wasn't a huge increase in, in risk that people worry okay. about. Mm-hmm. So, and then you had your second son at 41. 41. So I think I just want people to hear this who are 25 and yeah. freaking out about their, like, not being married yeah. or, like, how they've been waiting forever. Yeah. Like, if you have a baby at 41, it's okay. Yeah. Like, it is okay. Your yeah. path is your path. I can still play soccer with them. You know, yeah. it's not like I'm in a walker <laughs> or anything like that. So, yeah, I was going to say, do you, ha- do you feel like being an older mom, you've had to keep up with your health more? Like, or it's, I mean, or is it more top of mind? Like, <laughs> I got to, like, I got to keep up with these little babies. Like, I mean, I think about them, like, when they're my age. Yeah. Right? Like, I really, I'm and like, then you calculate out how old you're going to be. <laughs> I'm like, wait, how old do I want them to be, like, when they get married and have children? And I'm yeah. like, well, we, we got to do some things right here. Yeah. No, I mean, I do think about that. Like yeah. if, if you want to live a long time, but we can't control the things. That's right. Yeah. Um, so I guess like one of my last questions to you is just like, if you could turn back time, mm. talk to your 18 year old self, yeah. what are you telling her? Yeah. I would tell her to trust herself. Mm, I like that. And yeah. Why? Um, I, I dealt with some insecurity. I think I did project a lot of confidence, but I, I often would second guess myself and decisions. And I think what I learned over time was mm. I had a good gut. Yeah. Like I, I know how to be thoughtful about things mm. and I just wish I wouldn't have worried so much about making the wrong decision and just kind of trusted myself a little bit more. I love that. I feel like when you get a little older as a woman like that is a, like a common thing I hear is like trust your gut, but I don't think we, I don't think we, um, trusted enough. Like I feel like women have an intuition. I was just talking to a yeah. friend earlier about this. I was like, she's just started dating this guy and you know, I said, my advice to you is just sit with this decision and with all this information you know about him and just like turn inward and ask yourself, does, do I feel good in this relationship? Because I find a lot of women when they go through a divorce or they get cheated upon or they, you know, do something, most of the time they say, I had a gut feeling. Mm -hmm. I had a feeling it wasn't the right move. Yeah. Whether it was a career move or, you know, a person they were dating or whatever, like most people have, and especially I think if you're a Christian, like you can hear from the Lord. Yeah. So sometimes trusting your gut is listening to the Holy Spirit and not letting your fears and, you know, insecurities overwhelm just him saying, go for it or don't go for it. Yeah. And and in that we're not supposed to worry, right? Like we're not supposed to worry. So yeah, which is hard, but yeah, I think you're right. We got to. I love that advice. That's awesome. Do you have a leadership rule that you live by? I know this is kind of like a, you might, you may or may not have one, but. I don't know that I have a leadership rule. Mm -hmm. It was funny. I was talking to my husband about this. He's like, Amy, you are just super big on being authentic. And I'm like, yeah. Like, I think. That's kind of your leadership rule. I think, yeah. I mean, I don't even know if it's a rule. It's just like kind of integrated in who I am. Like, I don't like people who aren't authentic. Yeah. Like, I, you know, I'd like to be that way to other people. Like, Mm -hmm. I really want to be transparent in that way. So, and I think people respond to that kind of authenticity. I think it's a level of integrity, too. It's like, it's interesting Mm because, like, authenticity is just a variation of integrity and, like, everything you do do mm-hmm. like in your work as a journalist and as a writer is to tell the truth right yeah. and so it's like you want to tell the truth with your life yes you know and you don't want people to think you're one way when you're really another yeah, yeah exactly I love that you are a very authentic person Thanks. and what you see is what you get yeah right? you yeah. know <laughs> you're not fake <laughs> <laughs> and that's something I I mean this I'm gonna just gripe about women for a second I love women obviously I wouldn't do this podcast if I didn't but like the fake woman is so hard for me Mm. it's like I think partly it's just like you know we just want to know you like who are you like you know like you don't have to be any kind of way no if you're having a horrible day I want to hear about it yeah exactly yeah I want to I think people don't feel safe though I think that's partly why people don't I feel like if you've been hurt in the past it's easier Mm. to put up a mask and just kind of not be real but I would encourage you like if you are like I don't know if I'm an authentic person per se I think just taking the first step of like sharing something that you're going through with a friend or family member vulnerability is hard it is so hard yeah especially if you're somebody who wants to present themselves well Mm -hmm. I think if you have a degree of excellence that you care about that's hard to yeah 
you know, yeah. be vulnerable. It because is. you're like, I don't want them to think that I'm not put together, but like, yeah. I just want to be real. But I would just, I guess, try to think of a time when, you know, I think people respond well to vulnerability. They do. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to know if you, this is a fun question. Yeah. But if you have a free day, uh huh. the kiddos are like, let's just pretend they're not in the picture. Yeah. You don't have to worry. There's no yeah. mom guilt. Yeah. How do you spend your free day? So there's something that I used to do when I was single that okay. I love to do. Okay. That like when it's my birthday, my husband will let me do this. Not, okay. And I don't say let me, but. He'll encourage you to yes, do it. Yes, he encourages me. He does. He encourages me to do it. And I love to go and get breakfast by myself. Okay. And take the paper. It's like actual physical. Oh, yeah. Like we get the paper delivered. Yeah. I love it. Like the so physical newspaper. The physical paper and just sit there. And drink coffee and eat breakfast read the paper. and read the paper. And depending where you're at, like sometimes it's better to like sit at the bar, uh huh, so you can like talk to your neighbors, chit chat about yeah. the paper. I love. Th- I feel like that's <laughs> so okay. I, I I'm gonna embarrass myself for the sake of the story because we were in Vail recently mm-hmm. and they had the paper. Like the place we were staying always had the paper out. Yeah, and I was like, <gasps> yeah, the paper Vail daily. Yeah, yeah. Vail daily. And mm-hmm. I was like, you know, and they did like a nice breakfast. And I started leaving my phone in the room and just getting the paper and yeah. like flipping through it. Yeah. And it was like, I'm like, I feel like I'm such an old timey person. But like, isn't it relaxing? It kind of it's is. It's so enjoyable. And it's something about the tactile of yeah. like flipping through. That's so Okay, I have a question. Did you ever watch the show Newsroom? Oh my gosh. I'm obsessed. Did you like that? Oh my gosh. It was so good. I almost wrote an, uh, a letter to the creator when that show ended because I was did? so mad. <laughs> I was mad too. I thought they cut it short. I'm like, this should have no, kept going. I know. It was so good. It was such so good. I think they had like planned only like, what was it, three seasons or something? Something like that. Or maybe it was just two. I can't remember. But it was, it was n- either it was way. way too short. Too short. Not enough. I actually was like, that show made me be like, should I have been a journalist? Yeah. I feel like I would have loved this. You yeah. Know? And a second. It's a fun job. Yeah. And um, did you, and it was the same creator of West Wing, I think, right? Yeah, I think so. Whoever creates all that like fast, like de- dialogue. Sorkin. Yes. Aaron Sorkin, I is think it? is his name. But mm. yeah. Anyways, I had to ask you about that because I was like. Loved it. Whenever I think of you, I think of that show. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, Amy, thank you for being on the show. Thanks for having me. It's so I great to be you. with you. Yes. I know. We we talked about how we're going to do like a single ladies panel yeah. or something. Yeah. And we'll just have to have you back for yes. that. That'll be fun. I'd love to do I mean, that. you're not single now, but. No, I was for you a You had long 37 time. years of practice. <laughs> I did. So. <laughs> I know a couple things about it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, thank you so much, friend. Thank you. Thank you.